Hello, everybody. Welcome to this first digital episode of Media Voices Podcast, as I think is probably typical for every single live digital event that we've had going on lately. There have been a couple of technical hurdles. We are going to get Peter on. It's just going to take him a while to join. So, Esther, what, while we wait for Peter to join, hey, why don't you give a brief explanation for why we're doing this and sort of what the aims are? So it's not a, it's not a let's keep positive despite the fact it's a really crap situation. It's more of a let's look at let, let's shine a light on some of the examples that maybe aren't getting highlighted amongst all the other stuff. Yeah, so I've realized you can also now see my gestures. You can see me just here like. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was I think uh, we will get into it in a little bit, but I think I was having a conversation on Twitter during the week, and it really was um, what the big issue is doing, which really sort of kind of spurred this idea that publishers can do some amazing stuff. The big issue is sort of a, um, what do you say, a bit of a yeah, it's a very specific case because they are um, because they are so specifically geared towards providing for their vendors as well as the publisher itself and some of their, and some of their kind of, not, not shareholders, but the journalists as well. So Peter desperately wants to talk about them. I was going to say, yeah. why don't we begin by talking around something we began talking about last week, which is, what publishers are doing around paywalls because over the last week I've seen the example of the Atlantic brought up time and again just to really demonstrate the idea that you know people can re- remove their paywalls they can see a huge benefit in terms of the number of well not just in terms of traffic but the numbers of subscribers they get as a result um, so yeah it's been a real sort of I was going to say do you, want, do you want to take us through what's actually happened with the Atlantic for people that maybe haven't seen that yet yeah absolutely so in fact no, I think everyone's seen it because there's been it really sp- sparked this huge debate about whether you can you know, monetize your audience without having a hard paywall for this. So basically, they decided that they're not going to do, they're not going to have a paywall up around their coronavirus content, which was something that a lot of places were trying initially. Not just trying, they, they sort of removed their paywalls. They saw this as a kind of public health crisis. But for the Atlantic, it bore particular fruit. So they got insane traffic numbers. I think they, you know, there's a Nyman Lab article about this, which was like fantastic. Um, Oh, that's very odd. Esther, can you try talking for me one second? Hello, yes. Okay, strange. Seems like you should be able to hear him, Thomas. Uh, okay, so that's now just on Esther. All right, anyway. So they are... Uh, please let me know if uh, you can hear Esther now. Mm. Still can't hear me? No. You know what? I think this is a Skype issue. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In which case, potentially, we might have to try this again. What do you think? I don't know. I don't know how any of this works. You're the clever one. Can <laughs> nobody hear me? doesn't look like it. We're getting some comments that basically say that only they can only hear me, which is a problem because, obviously, you're the one who comes up with actually all the, uh, all the insight. <laughs> okay. Oh, no, Thomas can hear you now. All right. So okay. while right. we wait for Peter... Um, while we're for Peter, yeah, so uh, Naomi Lab basically did this fantastic explainer saying, uh, featuring an interview with some of the staff of um, the Atlantic, and they saw insane numbers. So they received 87 million unique visitors to the site, more than 168 million page views, and that then convert that ended up, you know, working out that they converted 36,000 of those over the course of a month, which was about as, um, successful a month as they'd ever done a lot of commentators basically said well they would have been happy that for an entire sort of like couple of months period and it's actually i, sort I, of com- I suppose we we just don't want to think about the percentages there do we that if <laughs> no. you have to get 168 million page views to convert 36,000 subscribers yeah absolutely um, um particularly when it's something as emotive as this you would have thought that if anything would have convinced people it would have been this but they're um You know, it's not just the Atlantics that's doing this. If you look at what the FT's been doing around that graphic, which created by my old uh, data teacher, John Byrne Murdoch, which has been shared all over the place, they've made that available for free. You must have seen that one, Esther. I've I've seen it updated every day on Twitter. I think he's doing an amazing job. Yeah. Um, But, I mean, you're, you're, you're in the camp that, information like this should be free aren't you because I've, I've had a change of heart on this this week so yeah i need to clarify that because i think i'm afraid i think i worded it very very badly last week um i was basically saying i think this particular topic should be free anything that has a direct impact on audiences health particularly around the coronavirus 
should probably be free. Obviously, it's not going to work for all publishers, and you have to have a paywall for places that are reporting on things like, you know, the impact of this on, say, media business models or, you know, anything that's not directly related to people's health. I think that, oh, Peter. Wait, wait, can, can we hear him? That depends if I was going to say anything. <laughs> we can hear you. Hopefully Fantastic. everybody else can as well. <laughs> okay, nice. All right. So Peter. who is doing a good job, The Atlantic? Yeah, The Atlantic's doing a really good job. Uh, do you know who's not doing a good job? Go on. Fucking Skype. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah, that's okay. been a bit of a faff. Should I should I put headphones on? Couldn't hurt. Couldn't hurt. I think I th- I'm of the opinion I just don't touch anything. Well, okay. <laughs> just think. I can't. Oh, do you know what? Okay, um, so yeah, I was saying I think coronavirus is stressing me to death. Peter, can you scudge <laughs> over to your left? Oh, side, that's please? a bad. That was bad phrasing, isn't it? <laughs> we can't cut you out now. We can't cut anything rude you say out. So be on your best behaviour. Oh God, that's true. Yeah. Okay, okay, go. So, so I'm just going to bring this around because so last week I was a little bit on the fence about this, mm. and um, there was an excellent pointer piece by Howard Saltz this week that actually um, took me about ninety percent of the way to convincing me that those paywalls absolutely should be up. Um, and and Howard basically argues that like food is is essential. Food is an absolutely essential life necessity, but supermarkets aren't giving it away. Um, police are being paid. So why why suddenly, because this is a health situation, should we make information free? Um, and he actually says that, you know, yes, information about a dire pandemic is absolutely vital, but so is major storms, so is a local serial killer. Um, and that if you if the ad revenue is falling away, something that equation has to give and that we cannot fulfill information obligations if outlets collapse. Um, and I think that's kind of, that, that's, mostly made up my mind I'm, I'm just very aware that in the uk we've got the situation where we've got you know we've got free access to healthcare, but it's not actually free we pay for it by taxes we've got the bbc which if you can't get information anywhere else that is a free service so i'm aware that in the uk we're very lucky but yeah i'm, I'm, I'm sitting on the paywall fence now yeah That's I, all I, the I read fence. that piece it was very it was very well argued in fact there's been a bunch of really really well argued pieces you know basically saying now more than ever is the time to get across the idea that information like this cannot be free. It costs money to produce, it costs money to research, and it costs money to disseminate. I think, though, if you look slightly more widely at this, this isn't an opportunity to just monetize people directly. This is an opportunity to really say, you know, we are on your side during this. You know, this is... I always see the argument advanced that, um, you know, news news never used to be free. It was always paid for. And I just think, well, it's a completely different situation now. And at a time when you do have so much misinformation being shared so rapidly on WhatsApp and everything, this is a real chance for publishers to really get on people's sides and say, look, we we are the trusted news source that we have always claimed to be. We are providing you with this very well-researched piece of information. And while you we're still asking you to pay for, say, political analysis or sort of sports content or whatever, we recognize that this is important to you. It's vital for your well-being and your existence, frankly. And I think that if you look at what the Atlantic's doing, it's been it's really bearing dividends. I completely take the point that this cannot last forever. And I think that there's something to be done with messaging when you go to people and say, look, we've done six months of this for free. The crisis is winding down. Now we're asking you to pay. And I think there's something you can do with messaging as The Guardian always does. You know, we used to call it the begging bowl approach, but I don't think that's fair. I, I, you know, I was never quite on, on board with the term. I think. Oh, saying, you t- come on. <laughs> no, honestly, you can go back to this. I was always a little bit on the fence. I just think that now more than ever, if you're going to be developing that relationship, now is the time to drop those paywalls only for this, not for everything. But what that is totally reliant on is building that relationship. And that's all about the messaging. BuzzFeed's doing a really good job on this, I think. Because they're actually, on every article that they're putting out around us, they're saying, uh, journalists of BuzzFeed are proud to bring you trustworthy and relevant reporting about coronavirus to keep it free, become a member. That that is straight to the point. It's like the Guardians, that thing the Guardian has, which I think is too long. But anyway. Have, has BuzzFeed got a quiz that you can tell if you've got coronavirus yet, or what kind of? Yeah, that's you're just on? such an old-fashioned way. Of, you should know better than this. You're the one that <laughs> has so avocado simple. toast for Christ's sake. Hey Peter, can you scudge slightly <laughs> to your left? There you go. 
<laughs> you know what? I had this set up so that I had I was perfectly flame frame. The light was nice. I looked amazing. Now now you're looking straight up my nose. It's bullshit. <laughs> Skype has a lot to answer for. Okay. Well, let's play some also, live. Also, also, sorry. One other oh, thing on. on this. Retention of these people is going to become insanely important because you can talk all you want about forming habits and whatever. Forming habits at a time when the world's upside down is really weird. And, and when you buy, uh, when you have this kind of impulse buy of, oh my God, I need to know what's going on, and you buy that subscription to the Atlantic or to the FT or to whatever it is, when the crisis is gone, a lot of people are going to go, why did I buy this? Counterpoint to that, the Trump bump is still on. Well, okay, the Trump but Trump is still in power, but the Trump bump is still ongoing. Yeah, that's the point. Trump is still in power. But I can't see if Trump gets out of power that everybody's suddenly, suddenly going to cancel their Wall Street Journal subscriptions. Oh no, no it won't but be. In, it won't. I don't know. But but their retention efforts must be insane. They must be spending a lot of time and effort on that. I think. You know, it's it's hard I, I, because this is such a unique situation. You know, this is, you know, I've seen so many places basically arguing that this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for journalists to really get to grips and really own the kind of the beat and really demonstrate they're an expert, an expert in the subject matter. But the issue is that the business model has collapsed. If you look at what's happening with advertising, particularly, it just feels like everything that publishers had, you know, were standing on or relying on that long tail of to find new ways to sustain themselves has been kicked away. So, you know, almost it's, I wrote that piece for DCN basically arguing that this is accelerating everything that was going on, all the trends. So it might be that the places like BuzzFeed, like The Guardian that have been doing this messaging for years are the ones who are best placed to sort of say, well, now more than ever, we need that support. And I, I mean, we all agreed last week, the places that have, you know, McClatchy's put everything behind a paywall and it's been argued that that's the right thing to do. That U-turn just seems to be the way that you lose so many potential subscribers. Yeah, I agree with that. I think when, when we're fighting a situation where, particularly in the States, there's just half the population doesn't trust the media, um, to to then be sort of, oh, we're going to do this because it's really important to give you this information. Oh, no, wait a minute, we've changed our minds. That's kind of bullshit. Okay. So what we need, really, is the fast food chains to come in, pay for yeah, all the subscriptions definitely. and save us all. That is yeah. such that is such good fun. Like It's not just a really, really nice story, but isn't that like an interesting experiment for a model? Like, what's yeah. the... I, we need to find out more about that. Who approached who? Like, who decided that fried chicken <laughs> was the one... Was, was the one, like, place to go for that trusted news? That's, it's amazing. Sorry, is that better? No, can if anything, it's much worse. Can you, can you see less of my nostrils? There you go. That's pretty good. <laughs> okay. Fucking Skype. Well, you know, we spoke about this last week, and I think that what we want to do now is talk more about what opportunities specifically around coronavirus people have been taking advantage of. And Esther, you flagged up what Galdem are doing with their membership scheme. So I wonder if you could maybe take us through what's going on there. Yeah, so um, Galdem, for those that don't know it's um it's this online publication and their whole aim is to like promote um perspectives from women and non-binary people of color um they've also got a print magazine that they do once a year um and they kind of i'd say professionalized uh, early last year because they got loads of investment to yeah sort of go full time um and uh, this is a bit of a tricky one because they they had this membership scheme in the works they've been planning it since last summer um, so it's not that they've launched it because of corona, coronavirus. They've sort of launched it in spite of coronavirus. Mm. Um, and I know a lot of publications have, have got stuff that they were going to launch. That they've sort of been like, yeah, actually, let's hold back. But these guys just thought, well, let's go for it. Um, so they've they've launched this membership scheme. Um, and what they said is that it, they a lot of their revenue is coming from band 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 partnerships <laughs> brand partnerships. Um, and that they, they wanted eventually to move towards community support. But coronavirus has essentially, as it has for so many businesses, just shoved them to the point that they've got to. Because um, all their brand partners are kind of, you know, backed off a little bit. And they said, now, actually, now more than ever, we need the support of our community. And they've got a really tight community, a really strong community. Um, and they have also, um, in the last, they're about a third of the way towards meeting their goal now. And they've also just launched this um, Pass It Forward membership. 
so you can buy a membership for somebody else which I, I thought that was brilliant that is that is brilliant i don't know why more places don't do that you know i've got that pie in the sky uh, dream of places basically doing you know you you buy a subscription and you have bought a subscription for somebody else who you'll never know it just goes in this bucket but that is such a good idea I guess subscriptions are, are there's lots of places to do that. We yeah, Mark Alka was, was doing that with physical that. box things. Where you get a box so that you can gift someone it, you get an issue of the magazine. Um the latest issue of the magazine, and you get some other stuff in there. So when you gift that, it, someone's actually, oh, here's a little form you fill in and you get your magazine. So you're actually getting this box, which people you know, people love boxes, mm. right? <laughs> Um, but uh, so when I was um, when I was putting the notes together for this, it, it did kind of hit me that. And Peter, I know you've talked a lot in the past about you've got to have diverse revenue streams. Yeah. And that that's not just about pivoting. That's not just about launching a paywall or pivoting to memberships. It's you've got to have. If you have three, four, five different streams, then when two of them go completely tits up, you're you don't collapse. And that's that's kind of what's happened here. Is that they've they're still going to carry on with their brand partnerships. They're still going to carry on with advertising, but it's it's shoring up things so that if ad revenue bottoms out or, or we get anything else, I mean, events revenues completely dried up. I know I've got a section on that later, but you you you're not then reliant on a single stream, and that's that's real diversification. Esther, have you seen how they've been doing some of the messaging for this? Have they, you know, mentioned the fact that it is coronavirus that's really spurred them to do this in that initial messaging? Uh, the post they put out was like, we've launched this in spite of coronavirus, not because of. It was just now more than ever, we, we need your help. Okay. It accelerated the timeline that they were already on, didn't it? That's yeah. the point. Yeah. And is there anybody else who's been doing specifically that? You know, anything that's kind of followed that Galdem model or has been doing something similar? Uh, Vox has literally today um, announced an audience support program. And I can do that now because you can see my quotes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's that seems to be a little bit more Guardian style. Like you can, well, in fact, no, it's, it's the same as Galdan. They've just not called it a membership scheme. But you, you donate to help them keep their stuff free. Um, I would say with Galdan, the content is also completely free. Um, you just get like little perks if you're a member. Um, Vox, similarly, they're saying everything's free, but you know, can you just, you know, we're, we're kind of in need of a a few pennies at this at this time. Okay, fair enough. A few pennies. <laughs> can I just? Can I just? I've been looking at my screen, and can I just issue an apology for if I've got resting bitch face? I'm trying to cut between stuff, and I've just realised that I'm scowling nonstop. So that's why. <laughs> but I can also play sound effects. So if you hear any, that's me doing that too. My my computer's back up. Can I try switching, or is that just daft? Uh, probably at this point, it seems a bit daft. Oh, come on. I just I don't... But the angles are so good. I look so good. I can we'll blur my one. background and everything. We just won't be able to hear you. Yeah, that's the problem. I think I that... I bet you could. Let's stick with... Yeah. I... Let's I'm stick so with MVP. Sad. All right, well, so I think that... sad. Hey, speaking of MVP, <laughs> the, uh, the big winner for this for us in terms of people who've been responding well and quickly has been the big issue. And Peter, what is the big issue and what have they been doing that has been so radical over the last couple of weeks? Well, this is the only pivot in media worth talking about in the last four or five years. All that pivot to video, all that bollocks. <laughs> it's nonsense. This is it. Rapidly, and I don't know who it was. I don't know if it was Lord Bard. I don't know if it was Paul McNamee. I don't know who decided, Jesus, guys, we've got a problem here. But very early on, even before the lockdown, they were issuing advice to the vendors saying, guys, you're not going to be able to go on the street. Um, and they switched rather to the vendors selling. Because the big issue, for anyone that doesn't know, and I don't know why you wouldn't know, but anyway, the big issues of street paper distributed by about 1,400 vendors many of them homeless, living in vulnerable circumstances, and they were selling on the street about 78,000 copies a year. The circulation has been going up for years. They're doing a really good job, and then all of a sudden, bang, we've got locked down, and these guys can't be out on the street selling. So someone really smart in Big Issue Towers says, we've got to switch to a subscription model. And very quickly, they introduced this emergency three-month subscription, thirty-two fifty. get it weekly, delivered to your door. I meant to bring it, but because of Skype, I didn't. Um, I just got the second issue with Baby Yoda on the cover. It's brilliant. 
Um, <laughs> I have to do that again. And it, it's, <laughs> <laughs> for you know, for for a publication who's I mean, it's not just the vendors. The vendors make fifty percent off the sale, so their income was gone because they couldn't sell it. But the big issue was in trouble because they weren't selling. They keep the other half, obviously. So with no sales, they weren't going to make that money. So they've done this pivot to subscriptions very quickly. And hopefully, this, I saw a tweet from Lord Bard, he reckons he needs 60,000 subscribers to get anywhere close to staying where they were. So hopefully they're getting there. Before, pre- here's the thing. Previously, they had about 600 subscribers. So you've got to go from 600 subscribers to 60,000. That's a big deal. That's so insane. I, I, I'd love to, you know, I'd love to know where they're at on that. I've actually tweeted Paul, but I haven't held him back yet. Um, the other thing is they're selling it now in some supermarkets. They're selling it in Sainsbury's, the Co-op, and RS McCall news agents. Um, I don't know how successful that will be because <laughs> I can't imagine there's that many people browsing the magazine shelves when they're going to places. I think they're getting in. Getting a toilet roll and getting out again. I have a story that's going to dispute that in a second, but carry on. (laughs) Um, But, you know, but whatever, they did the deal with the supermarkets and Iris McCall, and they're still keeping the 50% that should go to the vendor. So I just think this is is an example of someone who's, of an organisation who's had a business model in place for 20 odd years, almost 30 years, just going, that's not working for us anymore. Within a month, they've completely shifted their model. And, you know, I really hope it works, but hats off to them. Anyone that hasn't bought a subscription yet, get your finger out. Thirty two fifty, buy a big issue subscription. It'll, it'll, you'll feel good for it. You really will. But there's going to be an interesting question, when and if we ever go back to normal life, about how that how that shifts back, isn't it? Because you've got, at the moment, the, the vendors sell them and they kind of get to keep half of what they sell. But if... Yeah. I, I don't think they've even worked out how they're even distributing this money to the vendors yet, have they? Because it's, it's quite complicated. No, I'm sure it'll go on through whatever your kind of average sales where you'll get some percentage of that, um, you know, almost like the furlough money that you get from the government, that people are getting from the government. But there's, there's then a risk that if people who normally buy the big issue have now gone to a subscription, are but they going to go back the other way? But here's the smart thing in this, I think. this It's, a, it's like this emergency subscription is only three months. Mm. Okay, but, right. So people may decide, I love to subscribe, and then they'll keep that going. But people who buy, because part of buying a big issue, I don't, I don't necessarily get it now because I work so much from home. But <laughs> pre-coronavirus, um, but when I was working in London with you guys, I bought it every week at, at the tube station, and and the guy, you know, I said this before, he was he was a reason I bought it because he was funny and he and he was smart and he told me stuff that was any issue and. That relationship, I think, is part of that. So I think people will go back to it. I hope people will go back to it. My only concern with that is, if you look at what's been happening with magazines in supermarkets, it hasn't been the most secure you know, circulation figures over the last couple of years anyway. So I'm not sure that... I mean, it's a fantastic thing. It's absolutely brilliant what they're doing. And the fact that they have responded so quickly, even if you know they don't have those hard figures in mind about how the revenue share is going to work, is a testament to how quickly the Big Issue team has turned this around. Therefore, it, it, it seems to me to be that they're trying everything, which is so laudable. Yeah. It just might not work. Okay, so there is a big narrative going on at the moment that people are going to the supermarket, scrabbling over loo roll, and then getting back out. Actually, I don't know what the situation is in the UK, but in the US, the New York Post has actually reported that um, printed magazines are having a huge uptick. Um, so uh, Condé Nast, Meredith, Hurst, um, they're saying that the COVID-19 hoarding has actually helped boost their March sales. Uh, shoppers are kind of buying whatever they need to shelter and uh, glossies are apparently an essential part of that. So um, some of these numbers, um, one guy said that mag sales jumped 3% halfway through March and that that's up to 12% in supermarkets. And if you think about that kind of proportionally with their newsstand sales, that's that's huge. Condé said they've seen similar figures. Hurst have seen similar figures. Um the issue now that they're going to face, because, I mean, more people buying print is great, um, but the the issues that are now coming out are the ones that had ads pre-sold in them. So we could end up in a situation in two or three months' time where they can't sell any more ads against the print mags. Um, but people are actually buying magazines in print mag- in, in uh, 
magazines in print markets. People <laughs> are buying magazines in supermarkets because they're going home and they don't have anything else to do. Mm. Yeah, but you know what? One, that's America. Let's face it, they've not quite got the concept of social distancing and lockdown <laughs> sorted out yet. Uh, God loves you guys. Um, two, those are March figures and they're going to be, you know, I, half of that wasn't full lockdown anywhere. So what's happening now? Um, I, you know, I, the one I'd be interested in is seeing what um, online sales are, are like. So like from Newsstand or Code UK or from Mag Culture or any of those guys, I'd love to know what they're how they're doing. You know, if they've if they've seen an uptick, I'd I, I'd love this to be true. I really would. I think it'd be amazing. Um, was, we were talking about uh, who's going to be sort of the big beneficiaries of the idea that you have to stay in and, you know, you can't really do much. And, you know, people were talking about things like, you know, you can be a DIY enthusiast and this is like the best time to be in DIY because people are buying all that kind of stuff. And it, Esther, to your point, I bought a bunch of print magazines the other day, if only to do some arts and crafts with them. So I feel like there is, yeah, so I feel like there is potentially sort of this untapped market of people who are desperate for anything to do. And I think that might I mean, partly be behind why Disney Plus has done so well. Like it's fifty million <laughs> like subscriber. I mean, they, they they launched on the day our lockdown was announced. <laughs> yeah, I feel oh, so sorry for I that. don't know. That's just a little bit too much of a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> Is there like some Disney villain behind COVID nineteen? Hang on, uh, Peter. Yeah, I'm zooming in slowly me. on you. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, but I, I know there have been a lot of figures from places like Readly this week that have said that actually they're seeing a huge uptick, like their puzzle, their lifestyle, and a lot of the digital magazines on there. People are suddenly like, they're sent at home in the evening, they've you know, they may be working in their home office all day, and they just don't want to sit at their computer, so people are just looking for things to do. Yeah. I think there's going to no, be some know, really weird trends. Even, I mean, think about the MIT Crossword app. Do we think that people who have going to have uh, like joined in spades, or do we think this is something like podcasting, where people tended to, tended to do it on a commute, and therefore it's actually fallen off more than they expected? No idea. See, this is the kind of silence that we edit out. <laughs> <laughs> so, what I mean, just more widely, how are magazines doing in supermarkets? Do we know? And sort of in terms but of, I I have heard anecdotally that some of the supermarkets, W. H. Smith, are cutting the number of copies that they've ordered. Mm. So because they don't have the footfall, they just do not have the footfall that they had before. Yeah. Uh, but W. H. Smith and supermarkets are, are different. W. H. Smith, they're often in commute places, like you know the tube stations, train stations, uh, whereas places like Sainsbury's, you know, if you try going to the supermarket recently, you're queuing around the door. Yeah, but you're not queuing by the newsstand. You're queuing out the front. With some big daft security guys, one in, one out. And the He's last thing on your mind guy. is, yeah, the last thing on your mind is you're thinking, oh, I wonder what issue of my favourite gardening magazine is on the newsstand at the moment. You're thinking, I hope there's shit, there's toilet paper. <laughs> there is. Yeah, you only have to find a copy of the Sun, and then you set. Okay, uh, hey. I th- I'm just going to say on this, I, I think it's going to take. A little bit more time to actually see the impact because I know again I've heard anecdotally that subscriptions have gone up. Mm. Um, I, I guess we're just going to have to wait and see. But my money is that this is going to be a good thing for print magazines. Oh, media voices! You think this is going to be people? <laughs> claim. <laughs> you think this is going to form habits for people in the long term? Yeah, I think so. I think if yeah, th- there are a lot of people that you know amidst all the panic are sort of saying actually it's quite nice in a way to step back into. You know, whether that's DIY or, or puzzles or colouring or whatever else, just focus a little bit on things that isn't rushing around and other things with life getting in the way. That's not downplaying the seriousness of the situation. I'm in a flat and I'm quite bored. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah it, it's people kind of getting back to to physical things rather than just going saw, out and being um, busy. I saw somebody on Twitter the other day, uh, in fact, earlier today, saying, how much would you pay now to be able to go to a pub with your mates and spend 40 minutes just having a conversation over a cold pint and the bidding began at 50 quid. So I think it's going to be, people are going to be going out of their fucking minds by the end of this. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, maybe that insanity will help with print sales. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I want I want Esther to be right on this. Absolutely. So we've, we've switched around again. Now I'm the optimistic one. <laughs> and, you're, and and supporting print. I like it. I know. So listen, let, my, we move my on? work here is done. 
<laughs> I think we should move on because there is, you know, for, for years, the the kind of abiding wisdom was that events-based businesses were relatively more stable than anybody else because they did have this kind of raft of events throughout the course of the year. They weren't reliant on any one particular source I mean, of yes, revenue. that's... That's why we launched the awards, right? Oh my God! How lucky Sneak did we get that one then under the wire? How lucky did we get with the timing of that? Seriously, but yeah, the the idea now is that events based businesses are extremely exposed to something like this, and you see the number of ones that have been cancelled, not just in the kind of publishing and marketing worlds, but you know, throughout it, even E three, which is arguably the largest conference in gaming, which is the most lucrative medium, has given up the ghost of this year. They've decided to just push everything to twenty twenty one. Everybody who would have been there is now doing digital events. And it's hit, in the media world, it's hit everybody from kind of the huge, great ones who are doing, you know, uh, if you think about what, say, I don't know, Economist was doing or FT with their kind of raft of events, they've now effectively just been shelved for at least the first half of the year. They, You know, they've taken a huge hit, but it goes down to the smaller ones as well, like Tortoise, which we talk about quite a lot. And even the sort of Hacks Hackers, which is, you know, 30, 40 people at a time, they're fig- having to figure out how to do this digitally. And I think that one publisher who's been doing this... Oh, go on, Esther. Oh, no, you carry on. I think oh. I think you're going to be leading into the one publisher that... Ah, okay. Well, I was going to say, I think the one publisher who's been doing this incredibly well is Pink News. I don't know if that's something you agree with, but what they've been doing around their effective replacement for Pride, which is, you know, it's a huge, great festival celebrating LGBTQ plus, uh, you know, um, stuff. I don't know how to best put best that. And it's been taken online and it's less a festival and it's now more sort of a celebration or rather more an extension of what they've been doing editorially anyway. But I don't know that there's any particular success story here apart from mitigating what would have been happening with events. So they were saying that they were struggling with sponsors, weren't they? Because they've got this online festival that they're going to do. But they say normally at this stage they've got sponsors for like six, seven months in advance. Yeah. Whereas now they're like basically no we're all going through the same thing, right? And no sponsors are really in the point that they're sort of ready to commit any budget to anything at the moment. I so I copy edited an opinion piece a couple of days ago that was effectively arguing um that any sponsor who want any sponsor worth their salt should be looking to sponsor these live event these digital events because it proves that it's not just a stunt. They're not just doing it to get, you know, their names on banners and get the kind of positive press associated with appearing as sort of at Pride. It's putting their money where their mouth is, and it's really demonstrating the idea that they are genuinely invested in supporting it rather than getting some, you know, easy headlines. But you're right, like, what the hell are people supposed to do around getting sponsorship for events? So, now I'm going to lead into my thing that I noticed. Um, there's a really interesting thing with the FT. The uh, Digiday did a really good piece on this yesterday. That So the FT have got, they've got FT Live, which is their event section, and they'll charge, you know, hundreds of pounds for people to turn up to these events. And they've they've obviously hit the same issue that we can't travel anymore. Um, so they launched their digital dialogues last week and they had a uh, almost like a webinar and they had this first webinar that was looking at the global economic emergency. They had 4,600 people tune in to, to watch it. Um, and they're looking to get the next one sponsored. I think they said they had 50 people already in conversations about sponsoring. But I was thinking there's, there's actually a really interesting parallel with, with print here that when it comes to going somewhere, when it comes to, getting physical things people are happy to pay because mm. they see a direct cost you know they're getting something they're, they're going somewhere but you can't nobody will pay you know 250 pounds to attend a virtual event and that you know there's the production costs are less but you still have costs you still have people to pay to put it together and it's like it's it's we're going back into the thing where everything online is expected to be free <laughs> <laughs> say, um, no, I agree. I agree with it. I agree with it. Make. I agree with it. Difficult to get people to pay to go to a virtual event thing. I definitely do. Um, and I, and I agree that people people go to events to meet people, and you can't. You know, you don't really meet people, do you? At a virtual event. I don't know what you're talking about. I've never felt closer to you two. <laughs> You know what? Yeah, actually, this is a great example of how shit virtual events are. Huh? Um, I don't know. It's just, it's different. It's just so different. It's like the difference between a print magazine and a digital magazine. Do you remember we, it was maybe, what, two weeks ago, we, we highlighted that uh, Flashes and Flames article 
where Colin Morrison was talking about how this is an opportunity to reset and really start thinking about your portfolio sort of like five, 10 years down the line. And one of the yeah. points I think he made was how do you, you need to start investing in stuff like that, not just as a, as a replacement, but as an additive thing. So how do you do virtual events properly and extend sort of like sponsorships throughout those rather than having everything concentrated around the four or five big temple events you have? And honestly, maybe this will move the needle slightly on what people consider to be sort of like a worthwhile use of sponsorship money. No, I know that people are, so particularly in the B2B space, people are looking at it. It's not just meet people, it's do a deal and there's these virtual deal rooms that are going on and I can kind of see where there's a, there's a value in that. I think Incisive has, has done some stuff. Um, they've just released a new platform. Um, I, I don't know whether it's coincidentally or whether, again, they've sped it up because of coronavirus. So they're doing some stuff in, in there, but if it's like, I don't know, the Ideal Homes exhibition, really? Are you going to do that? Or BBC Good Food Shows type thing? You know, other, like Women's Health are doing some stuff, aren't they? Um, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, uh, Women's Health was supposed to, they were supposed to have their live event last weekend, and they instead, um, I mean, the, the Women's Health Live, you sort of, you paid £40 a ticket as a consumer to go, um, but they instead did like a free, um, like, get, I was going to do that. That's, that's not a hashtag. How, how do you hashtag? Like, hashtag, uh, hashtag get fit done virtual event. And they so they set up this Facebook group which um, people who wanted to attend the event could join. Um, and they got over ten thousand members in the in in a week, which is really amazing going. But it's free. So where are they? Where does the money come from in that? You've still got staff to pay. You've still got people to pay to put it together. You know, there are people like Alice Living and Jessica Ennis Hill doing talks. You've you've got to pay them. But the money isn't quite coming the other way. It, it, it's really difficult. Guys, I, I seriously want to talk about the uh, the other one that we've got. Go on then. Here. Go no, on then. I just, I've just i literally just checked. It would break an embargo. Which <laughs> one? So, well, I can't oh, even mention my it. Word. it would break the embargo. Why would you put that in the notes then? Oh, I thought it was I thought it was out. But yeah, we'll talk about that. I presume Are I just you kidding? Also... Yeah. <laughs> That's the best bit of this whole. Oh, okay. Well, there is something. There is there is something of interest here that we. When is the embargo? Uh, just in tomorrow at noon. Oh, are you joking? Yeah, uh, Easter. Chris. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> but okay. So say that this. Say that we're looking at something like. Say that we were to launch our women's health live equivalent. You know, how I've seen a bunch of brands are almost transitioning into that space of. Uh, either monetizing their existing back catalog through, you know, putting up massive video archives that let people stay fit. But is there an opportunity here for people like Joe Wicks, who have their own personal brand, to really start making waves in that space and decided that they are the expert and that they can do this? You know, think about some YouTube stars like Yoga with Adrienne, who have vast, vast audiences. Could they almost become a brand off the back of this? Is Joe yeah, they, be nice? they could, but that doesn't help any of anyone in publishing or in media because you know this is part. This is very similar to that article about. So I can't remember even where it was, but it was let newspapers die, let journalists flourish. Yeah, it's the same thing. These you know, it's that individual trust. Trust has sunk to the individual, or or fallen to the level of the individual. Um. So could could men's health or, or women's health or healthy health health do a, do a deal with Joe Wicks? Yeah, probably, but it's always going to be Joe Wicks. Mm. I know I know this is a limitation of virtual events, but I'd be really interested if any if any of our watchers have any opinions on that. I guess people we can't type fast enough, but <laughs> yeah, possibly. Well, I mean, has any uh, break, break, breaking news? The... Breaking news! Breaking news! I've just had a message from Paul McNamee at The Big Issue. He can't give me exact numbers, but he's telling me they've sold good several thousand subscriptions. And they don't want to give the exact number because they want people to see that they still need people to buy subscriptions. So, buy subscriptions. Uh, okay. Wait, what? Say that last bit again. They, they're not going to give the exact number because they want people to they know. They don't want to give out exact numbers so that people go, oh, great, job done. What they actually want people to go, oh my god, we've got to keep doing this, we've got to keep going. So, keep getting the momentum going, yeah. yeah. Okay, I suppose that makes sense. And they are doing some amazing stuff already. 
I'd be I would be um, astonished actually if they didn't come out of this among the least. Is scathed a word, or is it always like scathed? Yeah, sort of among oh. the sort of the the publishers who people can point to and say, well, they did absolutely everything they could. I don't know. I mean, what Paul's saying in here, he says it's been mental. It's been a frenetic period. Producing the magazine is tricky in and of itself when everyone is remote. But the team are doing brilliant. Like, everyone's tired but resolute. <laughs> he says he's a fighter, which he is. Um, basically, just getting on, doing yeah. it. They've got an Android app going out as well. Wow. Did you you know, I, I, I think that's actually one thing. If you look back and you think, if this happened 10 years ago, the impact will be a lot more severe than now. We, we are so well set up for remote working, remote production, Some virtual people. events, and every, well, people, businesses that haven't have, have been forced to move very, very quickly. At least the tools are available to do so. Yeah. To some extent. I mean, I think that we've seen, everyone has just become intimately familiar with the limitations of the tech for this. So you yeah, can't... no kidding, Skype. <laughs> Why are you on that? <laughs> I'm saying, but you can't necessarily use there is no one and done recreation for events like that. You know, I'm not saying that people needed to have invested in virtual events before, you know, actual VR headsets events, but it, it might have helped. (laughs) Yeah. We'll get there. We will get there, but you know what I mean? There's no, you can't use a zoom conference call to do, you know, everything you would at a live thing. But that's the, that's the other thing. Is what's going to what's going to start happening really soon is virtual fatigue. People are going to start getting really bored being on Zoom, and then they're going to buy print magazines. <sighs> they, I tell you what, they better not get bored of doing virtual events before my quiz really takes off. I'll be absolutely fucking furious if Corona quiz doesn't become like a BBC BBC led thing. I, I think it's classic. Uh, channel what's it bbc3 yeah fair well, definitely have. but so i suppose we've we've sort of rattled through that and we're sort of coming up to uh 50 minutes actually so obviously i think we all say that we struggle to find some very positive stories from this there's always a caveat to every single one of these it's either launched in you know to cover a hole that suddenly appeared or it's something that they've been forced into ahead of time as you know galdem did yeah, John, actually, I think there's a, there a piece I was reading. Uh, somebody had interviewed uh, Rafa Ali from Skift, um, and he was saying that basically that they will consider it a good job done if they make it through the rest of the year. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, that's a point. Survival has switched, or, or success has switched to being about survival rather than thriving. I saw, I saw another piece, actually, that was saying um, this was going to be the year that we saw some of the digital native publishers really turn that corner to profitability and then this came out of nowhere and it really was that axios article that we slammed (laughs) but it's true though isn't it we did last we were talking about the idea that you know even vice had potentially turned this corner and now it's not just that a lot of their events have been wiped out it's not just that advertisers are pulling away it's all of it and you know we we saw what is it what week week before last we saw the kind of the 68 million pound loss posted by the sun that is going to be minimal compared to what we see next quarter from them. And you know, it's so frustrating because it's not anything publishers are doing. Like, like they're getting, you know, I think the figure I saw today was 16 times more traffic than they've ever got in their lives. And it, still the businesses are failing. Yeah. Well, that if, just actually proves that scale is not the answer. <laughs> <laughs> if, if we needed more proof of that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> well, then... I think unless you, the two of you have anything left to mention, I think potentially we should wrap this up. Learn some lessons about tech and using Skype for this, for the future. But yeah, there's a, um, I think that we can sort of wrap this one up now and then release the audio as a separate podcast on Monday. Release the audio! <laughs> so. I, I just, I'd like to say that I, I think in general, the coverage, the journalism has been pretty good in this whole situation you know i think there's a lot of really really good stuff being done there's still some utter shite um peter peter did you see that london life have put david icon <laughs> they've given Dave they've given david ike an interview slot 
What's he talking about? G- coronavirus conspiracies. He's got what it's all about the, the reptilians. Of oh, course, that... you, to be fair, if you're going to get someone to talk about coronavirus conspiracies, he's a man. <laughs> he's found um, his niche. I, I'm actually more worried about the Tory propaganda that we're getting around um, Mr. Johnson's hero status. God love him. I hope he gets better really, really quickly, but only so that he can uh, appear in front of the biggest public <laughs> inquiry of all time. <laughs> yeah. Did you see Emily Maitlis's thing? Oh, awesome. Mwah. She should be Prime Minister. Yeah. Well, actually, no, she shouldn't. She should just continue to poke holes in the bullshit that most politicians <laughs> come up with. No, that was amazing. That was absolutely brilliant. Okay. Well, as you said, there's still opportunities for journalism, but it needs those business models to support them. You know, even though, you know what, should we, let's wrap this up. I'm going to start playing the uh, the theme underneath us so we can talk our way out. Oh, this is going to go badly. Oh, it's fine. Can we dance? <laughs> yeah, if you want. So this is now playing. You guys might not be able can't to hear that. No, I can't hear it. So oh, I'll that's just do it. Trust me, it's going out. So thank this you very much. This is not how a silent disco is meant to work. Yeah. <laughs> So thank you very much for watching this first ever live digital event from the Media Voices Last team. Last ever. <laughs> we'll get better at it. We'll get better. So this is going to be released as an audio episode this coming Monday, and it's going to be the last one before we take a break for a couple of weeks. So we're going to be back on May the 4th. Esther, presumably you want to say something around that? Uh, this is not coronavirus related. We've just been going solid since January and we're already tired. Oh, I thought you were going to make a May the 4th reference. What? May the 4th be with you? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, foul, foul, there. <laughs> so, Peter, if people want but to stay in touch with us, how can they do that? Stay off a of skate. Uh, and I mean, well, you can You can follow us on Twitter at Media Voices Pod, um, uh, where we get stories out every day. And you can, I might, you know, you guys can talk about website. I don't want to talk about website. It's just colour coded at the end, and it's my job know, to the website, so that's why I'll this do is that. The stuff, so this is the stuff that normally gets edited out. <laughs> okay. So yeah, we, we are taking a like podcast break, but we will be posting uh, stories out still on Twitter. Um, our website is voices.media. We've got all the transcripts, analysis, everything we do. There's the newsletter sign up on there. And there's a lovely discover section to find relevant episodes if you want to go back as well. Um, I know a lot of you guys listen to us in your commute, so please do like find time to keep listening. As you walk wanna... from your living room to your kitchen. Yeah, we've, we've got some great interviews that I know have been overshadowed a bit by COVID, so please listen. Yeah, absolutely. Well, in fact, thank you very much for your comments as they've come in. They've been uh, illuminating. But yeah, until we're back on and May not, 4th. And not all abusive. <laughs> not all abusive. But until we're going to be back on May the 4th, thank you very much for watching and very nearly said listening. Stay safe and goodbye. Ta-ta. Bye. We can wait. <laughs>